So there was this cab driver and this priest that they died at the exact same time. Like this has never happened before in the history of humanity. And yeah, Jesus and Peter are up there talking like, well, what do we do about this one? You know, we've never had this before. And like there is like this little loophole that if you die at the exact time as someone else, like only one of you gets to go to heaven. And so they're talking about this. And like the priest is thinking, okay, I got this one made. Like, you know, I've given my life to uh, faithful service to the Lord. Like, you know, I've served hundreds of thousands of people communion. I've uh, loved, I've served, I've given, I'm theologically trained, I've prayed, I've been a good person. And I'm guaranteed this spot. And this poor cab driver, I feel sorry for him. And the cab driver's thinking, gosh, I've cheated all these people out of money. Um, I've taken shortcuts, I've taken long routes. Um, yeah, I wasn't the nicest person. Um, against this priest, I got no chance. Yeah, so uh, Jesus and St. Peter, they called the priest in, and they called the cab driver, and they looked at the priest, and they said, you know, Father, we want to thank you for your years and years of uh, faithful service. You have just been great. Your people, uh, they love you. You've prayed. You've served them communion. Um, you've been so generous. You've given your life to God, and you know, there, there's one issue, though. Um, we're actually going to have to take the cab driver. Um, because, you know, Father, people have been coming to your church services for decades, and you put them to sleep um, time and time and time again. And when they get in the back of this guy's cab, they pray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we're talking about prayer uh, this morning, and, um, you know, Megan wrote that song. and It's, it, it's a beautiful song about just such a powerful, powerful, um, you know, uh, pericope of scripture. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find something better than what we're going to go through today. Um, and I think when I think about prayer, like a lot of us think of prayer like this, you can show a picture now. Um, so this is, uh, this is me and David. Now you can tell that there's some serious sweat going on that day. We were, uh, we were on vacation. This is down at Silver Dollar City, probably about a month or so ago. And, um, there's one person in our family that's fearless, and there's three of us that are pretty much cowards when it comes to uh, fast, adventurous stuff. Uh, David is fearless. Um, I drew the short straw. So David wanted to go on like all the roller coasters there. There's like seven of them, and we rode like on all 12 of them. Um, <laughs> like, you know, if, you know, if it was like, like hot this week, I mean, it felt like spring break compared to what it was like that day. I mean, it had to be like 160 degrees. I don't even know if the thermometer reads that high. And, like we were drinking sprites and lemonades and standing in line going on all these rides and um i can honestly tell you i never remember a day where i prayed so much in all my life yeah you know, you're just climbing it whoa <laughs> i think we think about prayer that way like um you know prayer is like us going to god telling god what we need or what we want um no there, there's nothing wrong with that but that's just like that's just like the tip of the iceberg you know, there, there's so much, and we're going to look at this today, there's so much more to prayer uh, than that. Now, the first thing I want you to see on the screen behind me, um, prayer does not change God. Prayer changes uh, the one who prays. There is nothing that you can do to change God's nature. God's nature is fixed. It's always been the same. It is. It will always be. You know, prayer does not change God. Prayer changes the one who prays. Now, think about this. Christ is a, a, essentially the exemplar. That is, like, here's the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is that we are to resemble and not merely profit from him. You know, the purpose of prayer is not to get the things that we want. The purpose of prayer is to be more like Christ. Now, try doing this. Like, try talking to someone for like, a long period of time, what's going to happen. Um, is the two of you are going to be more like each other? As we pray more, it's not about what we can get from God. It's not about what we can extract from him. He's already given us everything that we need. Um, what it is, it's for us to resemble him. It's for us to change. You know, you can't, like, pray for your enemy and not change. You can't pray for your kids consistently and not change as a parent. You can't pray for your spouse uh, consistently and not change a, a, as a spouse. What prayer does is, is something in us. So I uh, met a guy about probably 11, 12 years ago. Um, we're about the same age. We were both in our uh, early to mid-30s at the time. Um, only met him once in my life. Uh, 
It turns out that we both have two boys. His are a little bit older than mine. Uh, it turns out that we, you know, pretty much have the same occupation. Um, we both like sports. I like the Packers. He likes the Cowboys. Um, one of us likes God's team and one doesn't. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so almost every month, um, he hand, I, I get at the office, he handwrites me this uh, little note. Um, it's a handwritten note. We don't get too many handwritten letters anymore, do we? Um, and it, it's just a letter of encouragement. Um, you know, he encourages me in the letter. There's usually like a little prayer. Uh, for me, I keep all these letters. He's done this for, you know, 10, 11 years. Now I got, 100, I got over 100 of these things. I, I keep them in a little toad in my office. It's one of those plastic ones that you have like a little blue top and the little hooks in the side, and they're all in there. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, he doesn't really say much about himself. There's not much to say. Um, you know, once he, uh, once in a while the kids will come and visit him or he'll have like a really cool ministry story. But, you know, his ministry stories are from inside a prison because uh, that's where he is going to spend uh, the rest of his life. Um, you know, sometimes uh, what will happen is I'll get discouraged. Um, you know, I'll feel distant, whatever, and I'll open up this little box and I'll go back a few years and I'll read this letter. You know, these letters are full of wisdom, they're full of grace, they're full of uh, compassion. It's his ministry. He's got a great thing going um, in the prison. You know, he's got this ministry with basically if you're in prison for the rest of your life, um, you know, you're like a hardcore sex offender, a drug dealer, or a killer. Um, you know, those are his, that's his congregation. Like, that's part of his ministry. But part of his ministry is to people like me that he sits down and, like, he'll write this little letter and, you know, a few days later I'll open it up and read it. Now, isn't that, like, this amazing ministry? Um, like, you can do that, you know? You got the time. You got the resources. You got the intellect. Um, you can do this. I had told the 9 o'clock people, and I believe this, like, you know, there's probably like 500 of us here this morning or something like that. What if all of us just said, you know, this month we're going to do that. We're going to sit and just write somebody a letter, and the only point of this letter is to encourage them. You know, maybe have a little prayer in there for them. Um, you know, this is a letter that we can do. Um, you know, it, it's really cool stuff. It's, it, it's powerful stuff. And, and what, he, what he's doing is he's making the most of where he is. He's messed up. I mean, he, he, he messed up big. You know, he's going to pay for this for the rest of his life, but he's making the most of where he is. Now, there's a man a long time ago who was making the most of where he was. Now, this man did not do anything bad. He was in prison, um, but he wasn't in prison for doing anything bad. He was in prison for believing something great. You know, because of his belief, the government, the Roman government, thought that he was a threat, so they threw him in jail. The man's name was Paul. Now, the verse that Megan read a little bit ago, the song that she based that off of, um, Paul's prayer came from the prison in Rome in the year 62 A.D., now, Paul wrote this specific letter to uh, the Ephesian Christians. The town of Ephesus is in uh, what today would be um, southwestern Turkey. Um, it would have been heavily Greek-influenced at the time. Um, and it would, have been, um, it would have been one of the churches that Paul would have uh, planted. Now, Paul's letter does not end up in some box under a desk that, uh, you know, these letters are occasionally reviewed. This letter of Ephesians is probably the most read letter um, that has ever been written. I mean, if you're reading through the Bible, you've read Ephesians, or you're going to read Ephesians, and, and like you read this, and you're like, wow. Um, you know, this is inspired stuff. Like, God had a hand in this one. I mean, you can read the Bible. I don't think you can read the Bible anywhere for more than a couple of minutes and not get something, but you can't, like, read Ephesians just for a few moments. And, I mean, some of, the, some of the most, I mean, the essentials of our faith are in Ephesians. Like, Paul, in... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, we're saved by grace through faith. It's absolutely nothing that you've done, but it comes free to you as a gift from God. You know, two verses later in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 10, Paul, he, he gives us this image. He says, you are God's masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. Like, you know, take the greatest artist in the greatest work, and, and you're God's masterpiece. All of us are. You know, we read that and we, we get a sense of who we are and we read that and we get a sense of who God is. And he continues in verse 10. Um, he created us anew in Jesus Christ so that we can do the good things 
that he planned for us long ago. You're here for a specific reason. You're here for reasons, and, and, and you're God's masterpiece. Now, sometimes, have you ever felt like an outsider or kind of like a stranger or left out or whatever? I mean, he's got a word for you in Ephesians. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household. You know, if we ever feel left out, if we ever feel alienated, if we ever feel estranged, Paul reminds us that we are part of God's kingdom. You know, one of my favorite verses is in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 10, where he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He doesn't just say, you know, be strong, period. You know, he says, you know, be strong in the Lord and in, in, in his mighty power. Paul just gives us this glimpse again, this reminder again that God can do more in us and through us than we are capable of doing by ourselves. Now, tucked in this letter, these six chapters, um, tucked in this, in, in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, um, I believe is one of the most powerful prayers in the Bible. Now, it, it, as I read this prayer, um, I, I just, I get a glimpse of Paul's passion. You know, so I want to give you the setting of where he's writing this. It's the year is 62 AD. He's in a crowded Roman prison you know, they don't have central air conditioning. It, it, it's loud. It's unorganized. It's chaotic. Um, it, it's crowded. You know, there, there's, there's people in here that are not the cream of the crop. And, and this is the context that Paul is writing this. And, and he starts off, he says, I fall to my knees. Now, personally, I don't think that God cares if you pray standing on your head or driving a car or laying in your bed. Um, you know, God, God is going to hear our prayers, but I want you to just get the passion of what Paul's getting at here. He says, you know, what I do is I, I fall to my knees and, and I, I pray to God, the, the Father. Now Paul's like this. He says, God, I'm little. I, I'm almost nothing. and I, I'm looking up to you and, and you're the one. You're the one that can do all these things. And you're the one that I'm, uh, that I'm praying to you. It's like he's pleading. It's like he's, he's begging. And, and I really believe as Paul is writing down this prayer, you know, I, I believe that there's tears flowing down his cheeks because he's praying about the people he loves to a powerful God that he loves. Now, um, I'm really not much of an expert at anything. Um, I wrote this 170-page paper like four or five years ago about the use of uh, humor in public speaking. I got this little title in my front of my name that I use sometimes. And, um, you know, I um, uh, know a little bit about this Danish philosopher that you guys hear about occasionally on Sundays. And, you know, those are probably about the two things I know most about. Um, but I would say the other thing is, it's actually this text we're looking at today. Uh, this text is uh, a text that I have, I, I've actually prayed this prayer, 5,000, 168 uh, consecutive days. I could tell you this prayer uh, with my eyes closed, upside down, standing on my head. Um, this prayer is part of my life. Do you remember what happened 5,168 days ago? Yeah, so her, your son was born. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> she's doing the math in her head. 365 times 14 plus... Uh, no, you know, I remember like when um, I remember when he was born. Like it was like what two in the morning, and um, it's like you know after he's like everything's cleaned up, like this little baby's there, and the nurses are gone, and I think God, like I can't do this on my own. Um, we can't do this together. Like you not only have to be involved in this, like you have to be the one that is doing this, and. Just take us along for the ride. Now, I, I remember, like, I, I knew this prayer before. I mean, this prayer's been a part of my life for a long time. Um, but what I want you to do is, I want you to, like, I want you to think about someone you love, okay? Um, maybe it's your kid. Maybe it's a, par maybe it's a parent. Um, maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's, uh, um, you know, like just someone you love or whatever. Just think about someone that you really, 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 really care about. Um, 
Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to pray this prayer, okay? Now, I want you to see, like, the power that exists in this prayer. Yeah, this is something you can do. And I, I would say you can pray this prayer for yourself. Now, God loves you as much as anybody else in this room. And one way to make sure that this, this prayer is being prayed for you is to pray it. You know, sometimes I, I pray this prayer for myself all the time. Because what's in this prayer, it, it's what matters. So just close your eyes, and I want you to think of a person. Um, and I'm just going to pray this prayer, okay? When I think of all this, I, I fall to my knees, and I pray to the Father, the Creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from His glorious, unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts and you trust in him. Your roots will go down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand, and and then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might even ask or think. Glory to him and in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, you got your study guide and on that study guide is that prayer and um, you know, I think it'd be really cool. I mean, this is, this, this, this is a prayer that changes people. Um, you know, it changes the prayer, it changes the ones we're prayed for. Um, now, Paul starts off, and, and God is not small in Paul's prayer. I mean, Paul is not praying to, like, some theological concept. Um, God is a really big God. Listen to, what, listen to how he starts it. The creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious and unlimited resources... Now, Paul never once saw the fjords in Norway. Paul never looked over the Grand Canyon. Paul never was able to see Mount Everest. But Paul saw enough. He saw more than enough. He held little babies. He sailed the Mediterranean seas. There was times in the darkness that he looked up at the sky and he saw millions of stars. That's why Paul is able to say the creator of everything on heaven and earth. Now, He continues the prayer. I pray that from his glorious and unlimited resources. So Paul is not, I mean, he's praying to a big God with unlimited resources. Like like Paul, he wasn't, I mean, he knew about it. He read about it. He He was a scholar. He knew the Jewish Bible. I mean, Paul knew about when God stopped the river and the people of Israel were able to cross over into their promised land. You know, an escape from the Egyptian army. He knew about that. Like, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there when the sun stood still. He wasn't there when Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego walked out of the fiery furnace without a, a scratch or a scrape or a burn in their body. He wasn't there. But, you know, Paul was there on the road to Damascus when this ray of light came from the sky and it almost made the sun seem like a flashlight. You know, it knocked him flat on his back and, and he was there that day. He was there when he lost his vision. He was there when he regained that vision three days later. Paul described himself as as, uh, sick. (coughs) You know, he described himself uh, having a thorn in the flesh. I mean, Paul was beaten up many times. He was shipwrecked many times. Yet, um, as a church planter, as an author, uh, Paul has never had a peer. You know, so when Paul prays, from God's glorious, unlimited resources. He knows darn well what he's praying about. He is going to a really big God who can do really big things. And the first thing he prays for with people, now he starts with God, and then he goes to people. The first thing that Paul prays for is uh, inner strength. He says, I I pray that he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Now, uh, as I think about this when I prayed like for the boys, um, inner strength is the strength that matters. And I got like two pretty strong kids. Like, don't tell anybody this, but um, like we have these wrestling matches at our house. Um, 
I thought that was funny. Don't tell anybody about this. I'm talking like 300 people right now. Um, I thought I tried. They laughed at the 9 o'clock service. Um, I mean, their coffee was a little stronger. We'll have to work on that for the second service. Um, it's like we have these wrestling matches, and it's basically like a feat of strength. So you have like a 45-year-old man against an 18-year-old boy against an 8-year-old boy. So it's, it's not like the real wrestling, like, you know, the high schools and college. I mean, this is the stuff you see on TV on Monday night, like where you jump across a room and land on people. So it's kind of like this... And now the world heavyweight champion, the pastor of disaster. <laughs> and his opponent is beautiful Benjamin. <laughs> and weighing at 65 pounds, their opponent, he is dangerous David. <laughs> Suddenly we have this match, like David always wins somehow and, you know, keeps the title. Uh, it's like, this is strength. Like, you know, you're strong. Like, you lift people up and throw them around. And um, we haven't had any broken bones yet. There's been some pieces of furniture that are questionable at this point. But... But you know what, like, physical strength is a good thing, but, um, like, it's not the strength that matters. Um, you know, most likely these boys aren't going to be professional soccer players. Uh, you're not going to see them on the world's strongest man competition on ESPN, like, at 2 in the morning. Um, you know, Paul prays, uh, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Now, I know that one day, um, there's going to be a girl who breaks their heart. You can have all the outside strength in the world, and it's not going to matter. You need inner strength. Um, I know that there's going to be a job that they apply for, and they have their heart set on getting, and they don't get it. I know that rejection and pain are going to be part of their life, because rejection and pain is part of everybody else's life that I know. You know, I know at times that life is going to seem like it's a little bit too much for them. And what Paul prays is that he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. The next thing that Paul prays for is trust. He says, then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Now, I want to talk about, like, friendship and give that as a model of trust. And then we're going to look at how that trust applies to our relationship uh, with God. Now, true friendship is one where both parties are going to be able to look at each other. You know, so this might be your marriage. It could be like a parent-child relationship. It could just be like, you know, two friends. It's where both of you can look at each other and say, you know what? I'm getting the good end of the deal. You know, that's what a great, thriving, flourishing relationship is, is where both parties can look at each other at the same time and say, you know what? I'm getting the good end of the deal. Now, um, trust is going to be developed over time. Like the things that create the environment for trust is we listen, um, we're present, we do the things that we say we're going to do. Now, those are going to create the environment for trust, but ultimately trust has still got to be given. That's why it's called trust. You know, so here, here's what happens. Like the minute that I say, like, okay, I trust you, the minute that I say that, I'm giving you permission to break my heart. It's like, okay, I, I believe that you are going to do the things that you say you're going to do. I, I believe that. I trust that. Now, you know, we're giving people permission to hurt us, but we're also opening up the possibility, the potential for these two great big doors of uh, intimacy and possibility to be open. Now, the great tragedy in life is when intimacy and possibility don't happen because trust is not given. Yeah, the one who withholds trust is protected from hurt in the short term. But simultaneously, they are going to be denied intimacy and possibility in the long term. It is going to be impossible to be intimate with someone that you don't trust. You know, so there's this environment that can be created, but still we have to take that step of faith. So you know what? I trust you. I trust that you're going to do the things that you uh, say you're going to do. You know, because of that, you know, I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm putting myself at some exposure here. You may hurt me, but I also believe that there's this great possibility that these giant doors of intimacy and possibility are going to be opened. Now, the same principles are going to apply then for our relationship with God. Trust means that we just don't believe that God exists. Like, the Bible tells us many times that the devil believes that God exists. I mean, Jesus, I mean, the devil was there and he tempted uh, uh, Jesus three times. You know, he saw what Jesus did. He saw Jesus' reaction. He knew that he existed. 
So trust is not just believing that God exists. Trust is believing that God is who God says he is and that God will do what God says he will do. So uh, as we look at this, like um, Jesus then asks us to be our friend. He makes this invitation to all of us that we'll be his friend. Now, only when we trust, now Paul prays for trust, only when we trust are these giant doors of intimacy and possibility going to be opened. So it's no surprise that in the beginning of this prayer, Paul is praying for trust for the Christians in Ephesus. You know, at once, when these doors are opened, we are going to be the friend who discovers that we are the ones who are getting the good end of the deal. So Paul prays, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. As we trust in him, all of a sudden, intimacy with God and possibilities with God are going to happen. Now Paul continues, your roots will go down deep into uh, God's love and keep you strong. Now let me tell you a story about two trees. Uh, there is uh, sugar maple and there is uh, white oak. Now they are planted um, on the same day. Let's just say it was like 20 years ago. You know, sugar maple, um, they're the same size when they're planted, and sugar maple, um, it grew fast. If you're familiar with trees, you know that this is a, a fast-growing tree. You know, the sugar maple um, in the fall is one of the most beautiful trees that you'll see. Its uh, bright red leaves stand out above everything else. You know, the kids would stand below sugar maple as those little helicopters would fall. And if you're really, really clever, um, you can take a pail uh, and put it in the sugar maple and you can get like the sweetest syrup that you'll ever taste. And you can put it on the pancakes and you can put it on the waffles. And that's sugar maple story. Then, then white oak um, didn't grow nearly as fast. Yeah, the colors in the fall are kind of cool. They're a, a faded yellow, but they're not that bright red. Um, you know, uh, the acorns come off the trees and it's kind of fun to watch the squirrels take the acorns and hide them for a snack another day. And then one day, um, there was a big storm that came. It was the biggest storm that either of these trees had seen in uh, 20 years. Now, after the storm had passed, these 80-mile-an-hour winds and these, these huge rains, there was only one of the two trees that was left standing. Sugar maple had uh, been uprooted. The roots of a sugar maple tree uh, only go about two feet deep and they were not able to withstand the giant storm that came their way. Now, white oak, you looked at it, and you couldn't even tell a storm had come. White oak's uh, roots go 15 feet down deep into the soil. There is virtually no drought. There is virtually no storm that will be able to dethrone white oak because white oak's roots go down so deep. Now, Paul prays, he, he, he prays that your roots will go down deep into uh, God's love and to uh, keep you strong. Now, you know what? I'm going to tell you a secret here. Um, storms are going to come in your life. They are. That's just the way it works. Jesus even tells us this. He says in John chapter 16, verse uh, 33, this is Jesus. He says, here on earth you will, it's going to happen, you will have many he doesn't say some, he doesn't say a few. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Now, some of these storms are going to be predictable. You know they're coming. Some of these storms are going to blindside you and they're going to be totally unpredictable. Some of these storms are going to be challenging. Uh, some of these storms are going to be downright devastating. You know, depression and anxiety, they're a storm. Disease and death, uh, they're a storm. I could talk about storms all morning long. But Paul prays, I pray that your roots may go down deep into God's love and keep you strong. Now he continues, um, and you may have the power to understand, as all God's people uh, should, how, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. And, and may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand. I was trying to think about how to explain this, and 
the best that I could come up with is this. Uh, I think it was like three years ago, Amber and I went to uh, Maui in Hawaii to, uh, I was doing a wedding there and it was kind of like a vacation for us. And when people found out we were going there, they said, you need to take like this uh, highway or this road to Hana. It's this road that kind of goes around Maui. And um, so I read up on this road, like you know, I did the internet stuff, we watched YouTube videos, read a book, um, knew all about this road, I understood it. Now Paul says, I-, I pray that you will understand just how wide and how high and how long and how deep God's love really is. And when we pray that prayer, it's, we want that for people. We want people to have an understanding of it. But then he continues. It's not just enough to have this understanding, but we have to have this experience. And, and listen to what he says, that you may experience the love of Christ, that it's too full to fully understand. You know, so I remember when we hopped in the car that morning, um, and we started driving this like long, windy, hilly road. You know, it's probably about like, 20 miles, I'm guessing, and it probably took us like three hours. Um, you know, like the book, um, you know, talks about the ocean. But until you're on the road, you can't like feel the mist from the ocean on your face. You know, like the book shows you pictures of like these waterfalls. You know, that's the understanding, but the experience is you stand under that waterfall and you feel this cold water coming down on your head. You know, there's this black beach um, with this black sand. It's like one of the two or three places in the world that has this type of sand. And you can see the picture in the book, but until you walk on it, until you take your hands and feel the sand, you know about it, but you haven't experienced it. You can take a, a step into the ocean. Like, you know, you can understand what that might be like, but you experience it now. Now, Paul, he prays. He prays that you may experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Like, like here, here's where we go with this. Like, I don't want us to just try to understand God the best we could because that's an academic, intellectual exercise. What Paul prays, and you know, I've been praying this prayer for the kids in the mission trip this week, um, you know, that their roots go down a little bit deeper and they can experience the love of Christ, you know, so that we just, you know, we just don't have this intellectual understanding. Yeah, forgiveness is a good thing, and some people get it, that's great. But we totally experience forgiveness, that we're forgiven. That there's nothing that we have done that God hasn't said, you know, me and you are still cool. You know, we can uh, understand hope. Yeah, maybe there's this possibility that the future will improve a little bit. Or we can experience it like, yeah, this is God's promise for our future, that in our life, the best is still to come. You know, there's a difference between understanding and experiencing, and Paul prays for both. He says, yeah, I want you to understand, but even more so, because we can't understand fully and because understanding isn't enough, I want you to experience this. I want you to experience the depths and the heights and the widths and the breadths of the love that God has for us. Now Paul, he's getting pretty close to concluding the prayer, and he continues that you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life um, and power that comes from God. With all the fullness. With all the fullness. Have you ever, like, let's take a real quick poll, okay? Um, Who in this room has ever been full before? You've eaten too much food. Okay, so I think most of us probably have our hands up. Um, don't tell anyone this either, but um, every Mother's Day, um, me and Benjamin have this uh, competitive eating contest. Like, I used to run marathons competitively, now I just competitively eat, like, once a year. I've, I've evolved, I've moved on, um, have some new clothes to show for it. So, uh, um, those of you who knew me five years ago, you think it's funny. Those of you who didn't, um, you'll get it later, okay? Um, so we had this bacon eating contest at the uh, Mother's Day brunch at Tiburon. And I'm not sure if you've ever tried to have a bacon eating contest like with a 12 or a 13 or a 14 year old, but you're not going to win. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, I think it was two years ago, he ate 22 slices of bacon. That's, I, I mean, I got to like 13 or 14 and I just like hit the wall hard. I was full. I swore off eating ever again. Um, that lasted about six hours. I had like a sandwich for dinner that night. But like I was full. There was room for no more. Like that is God's vision for your life. It's God's vision for my life that we become full of, of the things that matter the most, that we become full of the love of other people. We become full of God's love, that we spend our life loving others and loving God. We know what it's like to be loved. You know, that we're full of doing the things that we want to do 
with the people that we want to do them with, that we're experiencing joy in what we do every day. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to be balanced and, and centered and, and, and purposeful and joyful. This is what fullness of life means, and this is what Paul is praying for us. So Paul concludes the prayer, Now, all glory to God who is able. Okay, so this is not about what you can do. This has nothing to do with, with your strength and your wisdom and your might. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might even ask or think. This, I mean, the responsibility is God's. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, so on the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed, the night before his death, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it and said, friends, this is my body that is uh, given for you. When you eat of this, do so and remember me. One of the things that I want us to remember um, is just how, I mean, he says, take this and remember me. What I want us to remember is the height and the depth and the length and the width of his love for us. Like you're loved, you're God's beloved, you're his masterpiece. Now Paul, he uses a really, I mean, you gotta dig into the text here, but here's what Paul's getting at. The height, the length, the width, the depth of his love. He's making the symbol of a cross. The next day Jesus would die on a cross and he says, I want you to remember this. And later, um, he took the wine, he blessed it, he gave thanks, and he said, friends, this is my uh, blood. It's the blood of a new covenant that has been poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. When you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Now, I want you to hear what I said. This is my blood that is given for you. For you. It's the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. And what I've been really, I knew the worship service was going to end this way this week, and what I've been praying is that as we come forward, that we just don't intellectually or cognitively know about this. You know, we don't understand it fully, but we experience it. And I really pray for all of us as we take the bread and we dip it into the juice, that we can experience the forgiveness that God is offering to us. We don't have to fully understand it. We can't fully. Now, now there's going to be some consequences. Yeah, there's maybe some messes that we have to clean up. There's still going to be some people that we're alienated from. But as far as God and us goes, things are cool. They're fine. We're forgiven. I really hope, I, I want you to think about that. As you take the bread and dip it into the juice, I pray that you may experience Christ's love uh, for us, even though we don't fully understand it. So let's pray. Oh,